Hello again, and welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk in general aviation with relevant news and flying tips for pilots and student pilots to help keep you safe. I'm Max Truscott, the author of several books on the Garmin G1000, 3000, 5000, and Perspective, and the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year. Today, we'll be talking about engine failures at takeoff, this time with Tom Turner about a study that suggests that partial engine failures are more dangerous than total engine failures. And so you don't miss next week's episode in whatever app you're listening to now. Take a moment right now. Touch the subscribe or the follow key. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. That way, next week's episode is downloaded for free. Last week in episode 261, we talked about a fatal bonanza crash near the Westchester County Airport in New York and things that the pilot and controller might have done differently. So if you didn't hear that episode, you may want to check it out at aviationnewstalk.com slash 261. And this is a listener-supported show, so if you enjoy Aviation News Talk, I'd like to invite you to become a member and join the club. You can support us by just going out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, and when you do, I'll read your name on the show. And of course, there's a link for that website in our show notes. This week in the news, the preliminary report is out on the fatal Bonanza crash in Westchester County. A pilot quits her job and gets a large bill from her employer, and an aircraft that landed on a golf course get some unexpected help. All this and more, and the news starts now. From generalaviationnews.com, bill introduced in Washington state to ban 100 low lead. GA advocates have joined forces to oppose a bill introduced in the Washington state House of Representatives that would ban the sale of leaded gas in that state. If it becomes law, the bill would begin a phased-in restriction on the selling, distribution, or otherwise making available to consumers of leaded gas in Washington state starting January 1st of next year. The restrictions would initially be placed on airports in the areas of greatest population, with additional restrictions culminating in a complete ban for the entire state in 2030. The GA alphabet groups have sent a letter opposing the bill. In the letter, the associations reaffirm the industry's commitment to moving to a lead-free fuel. The groups also point out that a ban on leaded fuel would cause an immediate threat to aviation safety in Washington state for owners and pilots of aircraft that require that fuel. Moreover, the legislation would bring an instant economic hardship for small businesses that sell fuel at airports, as pilots would avoid FBOs in Washington to get fuel just over the border in neighboring states and provinces. In opposing the legislation, the associations offered a better solution in supporting the ongoing EGLE initiative and the encouragement of operational practices at airports that mitigate lead exposure whenever possible. From PaddleYourOwnCanoe.com, FedEx plane nearly lands on top of Southwest Boeing 737 amidst dense fog at the Austin airport. The NTSB said on Saturday that it was investigating a possible runway incursion and overflight in which a FedEx aircraft nearly landed on top of a packed Cancun-bound 737 operated by Southwest at the Austin Bergstrom Airport. The incident occurred after the Southwest jet was apparently cleared to take off from the same runway that the FedEx 767 was cleared to land on amid heavy fog hanging over the area. And here's the ATC audio from that event. Austin Tower, FedEx 1432 Heavy, passing 5.4 for the Cat 3 ILS 18 left. FedEx 1432 Heavy, Austin Tower, 18 left, RVR, touchdown 1,400. Mid point six hundred, roll out one thousand eight hundred, one eight left, clear to land. Clear to land, one eight left, FedEx fourteen thirty two heavy. Tower Southwest seven oh eight, we're short of one eight left, so we're ready. Southwest seven zero eight off the tower, runway one eight left, RVI one thousand two hundred, midpoint six hundred. Roll out 1,600. Flight heading 170, runway 18 left, clear for takeoff. Traffic 3 mile final is a heavy 767. Okay, 170, clear for takeoff, 18 left, copy the traffic, southwest 708. 10 seconds later, we hear from the FedEx pilot. Tower confirm, uh, FedEx 1432 heavy, clear to land on 18 left. FedEx 1432 heavy, that is a firm, sir, 18 left, you are clear to land, traffic department, Roger, route 737. Roger. The frequency is then quiet for 28 seconds until the controller calls the Southwest jet. Southwest jet, are confirm on a roll. Roll on now. 17 seconds later, we hear this transmission apparently from the FedEx pilot. Southwest abort. 
FedEx is on the go. Eight seconds later, we hear this transmission from the tower controller, who apparently thought that the prior transmission was from the Southwest jet, announcing that he was aborting. Southwest 708, roger. You can turn right when able. Negative. The confusion is understandable because the visibility was so poor that it's possible the tower was unable to see the aircraft that were taking off and landing. This next transmission came 15 seconds later as the tower talks to the FedEx jet. Next, 1432. Climb, maintain 3,000, when able to turn left, heading 080. Wind, turn to 0, 0, 3,000, FedEx, 1432 heavy. 22 seconds later, the controller issues this instruction to the Southwest jet. Southwest 70, you can turn uh, left, heading 170. 170, FedEx, 1432, turn left, heading 360, contact approach on the 125.32. The FedEx jet was as low as perhaps 100 to 150 feet above the runway when it initiated its go-around. At that time, the Southwest jet was on the runway in front of it. From the data I've looked at, it appears that the FedEx jet passed about 500 feet above the Southwest jet, somewhere around the time that it was rotating. And it's worth noting that almost exactly 32 years ago, U.S. Air Flight 1493 collided with SkyWest Flight 5569 at LAX. The collision resulted in the death of 22 of the 89 passengers and crew aboard the 737 and the 12 passengers and crew aboard the Metroliner. And this comes from simpleflying.com. Wrongly assuming the runway 24 was clear of traffic, the controller cleared Captain Shaw to land, forgetting that the Metroliner was at the intersection waiting to take off. Following a picture-perfect landing, Captain Shaw began applying the brakes and reverse thrust to slow the aircraft. But with no time to avoid a collision, the 737 slammed into the back of the Metroliner, killing all 12 passengers and crew. The NTSB criticized the ground traffic control facilities at LAX, and placed the blame on the controller who had lost situation awareness of what plane was where on that day of the crash. From simpleflying.com, a Boeing 737-300 has crashed while fighting fires in Australia. A Boeing 737 fighting fires crashed in Australia, and according to initial reports, both pilots on board the aircraft survived the crash and were transported to the hospital with minor injuries. The incident took place at approximately 4 p.m. local. The aircraft, November 619 Sierra Whiskey, operated by Colson Aviation, departed from Busselton Airport south of Perth on Australia's west coast. According to data from Flight Radar 24, the aircraft climbed to 29,000 feet en route to assist firefighting efforts in the Fitzgerald River National Park. As it had done previously, the aircraft descended to around 700 feet to drop its load over the area. Having dropped the fire retardant, flight tracking data suggests the aircraft began to climb out of the area as it had many times previously. However, this time the Boeing 737 only managed to reach around 1,800 feet before crashing in the vicinity of the fire it had been fighting. According to 7 News Australia, a police spokesman commented, the two pilots on board were retrieved from the crash site by helicopter and airlifted to Ravensthorpe Airport. Both survived the crash with minor injuries, and I've seen a video of the two pilots who were walking to go into the hospital. Data from FlightRadar24.com shows that the aircraft was on its third mission of the day. The two preceding tasks had also been to drop firefighting substances over the same area. The aircraft is approximately 27 years old, built in 1965, and was delivered to Southwest in November of that year. The airliner flew for Southwest for just under 22 years before leaving the fleet in August 2017. The aircraft joined the Colson Aviation Fleet in June of 2019. From Patch.com, NTSB releases preliminary report on Westchester plane crash. The NTSB has released its preliminary report on the crash of a single-engine plane as it attempted to reach Westchester County Airport to make an emergency landing minutes after departing JFK, bound for an airport near Cleveland. The report notes a hole in the top of the crankcase in line with the number six cylinder position. An inspector also reported that a deformed connecting rod cap with two fractured and entrapped connecting rod bolts was found inside the engine adjacent to the hole. The pilot of the Beach A-36 told controllers that the small plane was experiencing a dead cylinder and radioed that the aircraft was losing oil pressure. An initial inspection of the wreck found fresh oil on the bottom of the fuselage beginning just after the wing route and extending to the tail cone. In addition, fresh oil was evident at the outlet of the lower crankcase breather line, according to the report. The plane was just one mile from the runway at Westchester County Airport when it crashed into a heavily wooded area. And from NTSB.gov, the preliminary report is out on a fatal Piper Cherokee accident that occurred near Suffolk, Virginia. On January 7th, about 12.13 Eastern Time, 
A Piper PA-28140 November 592 Foxtrot Lima was destroyed when it was involved in an accident near Suffolk, Virginia. The pilot and passenger were fatally injured. The pilot received his private pilot certificate on November 29, 2022, which would have been about five weeks before the crash. He owned the airplane and based it at the departure airport in Edenton, North Carolina. According to a mechanic, the pilot contacted him on January 1st to inform him that the RPM drop was excessive during a magneto check and that he had parked the airplane in front of the mechanic's hangar for further evaluation. The mechanic looked at the airplane on January 4th. He removed the spark plugs, cleaned them, and checked for resistance. He found that two plugs had very high resistance and one spark plug fired a little weak. The mechanic replaced those three spark plugs and reinstalled the five other spark plugs in the engine. The pilot arrived later that day before the mechanic had a chance to perform a ground engine run as he was busy working on another aircraft. The pilot asked if he could perform a ground run of the engine and the mechanic said yes because he could listen to the engine from his hangar. As soon as the pilot ran the engine, the mechanic knew right away that the new spark plugs did not correct the problem as the engine was skipping. The pilot shut down the engine, and the mechanic informed the pilot that the airplane was not to be flown until he could investigate further, and he would most likely be able to do so on Monday, January 9th. At the time of the accident, the airplane had not been released from maintenance as the mechanic had not had an opportunity to further investigate the engine anomaly. According to family members, the accident flight was a short 40 nautical mile cross-country flight to get lunch at a restaurant at Suffolk Executive Airport in Suffolk, Virginia. According to preliminary ADSB flight track information, shortly before the accident, the airplane approached the airport in cruise flight at an altitude of approximately 1,000 feet MSL at about 5 miles south of the airport. The airplane then descended rapidly and impacted terrain. A witness reported that she was a front seat passenger in a car and first observed the airplane in a nosedive. At that time, there were two spiral trails of black smoke about 5 to 10 feet behind the airplane. However, she did not observe any fire from the airplane. The airplane impacted nose down in a marshy field, and a post-crash fire consumed the majority of the wreckage. From HuffPost.com, when this pilot quit her job, her employer billed her $20,000. Kate Fredericks quit her job flying for the cargo airline Ameriflight in late November 2021, six and a half months into her stint as a pilot based out of Puerto Rico. It was the most expensive resignation she could imagine. Ameriflight told Fredericks she owed the company $20,000 for the cost of her training, since she was leaving before working for 18 months. Fredericks had signed an agreement to those terms when she was hired, so she wasn't surprised. She had heard stories of other Ameriflight pilots getting calls from debt collectors. Fearing the bill could wreck her credit, she negotiated a payment plan directly with the company, $250 a month for nearly seven years. She started mailing the company a handwritten check each month because she was told they couldn't accept electronic payments. Fredericks is now challenging the legality of that contract, she filed a proposed class action lawsuit in federal court in Puerto Rico on Monday, arguing that the agreement she had to sign with Ameriflight amounts to an unlawful constraint of trade, trapping workers in their jobs to stifle competition and keep wages down. According to the article, her Ameriflight debt is a high-priced example of what critics call training repayment agreement provisions or traps. These agreements require workers to compensate their former employers for the purported cost of training if they leave before working a certain amount of time. In a recent case that gained national attention, a PetSmart dog groomer was hit with a $5,000 bill for the retailer's grooming academy when she quit her job after seven months. The clauses have drawn the attention of the FTC because of the way they tie workers to their jobs and put a lid on pay. The agency recently issued a sweeping proposal to ban non-compete agreements, explicitly including trainment repayment provisions in the plan. Employer groups are likely to sue the FTC in an effort to stop it. But the FTC does not have jurisdiction over air carriers when it comes to addressing alleged unfair or deceptive practices. That responsibility falls to the U.S. Department of Transportation. On Monday, several advocacy groups sent a letter to the Transportation Secretary asking that he follow the FTC's lead and stop the use of training repayment provisions in the airline industry. The groups allege that at least six other aviation firms have used the clauses. According to Frederick's lawsuit, an Ameriflight pilot could owe up to $30,000 depending upon the training they received. In Frederick's case, her $20,000 tab would have been knocked down to $10,000 if she'd worked a full year after her training period. After 18 months, she wouldn't have owed anything. Her complaint alleges that Ameriflight withdrew the debt repayment agreement from new contracts last spring, but continues to enforce it on pilots who signed it previously. 
Frederick said she worked for a small commercial carrier before Ameriflight called with an offer in the spring of 2021. She understood she might be locking herself into Ameriflight for around two years, but the industry still hadn't recovered and stable work remained hard to find. Quote, There's this pressure put on pilots. You've just dedicated two years of your life to nothing but flying, said Fredericks. I had done all of these things and completely restructured my life. Frederick said she hesitated to file a lawsuit out of fear she could damage her job prospects and even be blackballed from airlines as a problem child, but she wants to put an end to the practice. She said, quote, people need to be free to make their own choices and not feel like they have a debt they're carrying around like Atlas with the world on their shoulders. No one should feel like they don't have any options. From FlyingMag.com, Enstrom announces first flight of new 480B helicopter. Enstrom said it completed the first flight of its new 480B turbine helicopter since resuming operations eight months ago following bankruptcy proceedings. The 480B is the 1,317th helicopter Enstrom has built, the company said, noting that the recently flown aircraft was not a leftover airframe from the pre-bankruptcy assembly line, but was built with components newly made and assembled on site. Enstrom's production test pilot flew the first new 480B and reported no issues. We were able to complete all our flight test steps on schedule. The team did a great job putting this helicopter together. Enstrom said it will display the new helicopter at next month's Helicopter Association International Heli Expo 2023 in Atlanta, Georgia. From FlyingMag.com, UPS Feeder Airline intends to buy 20 pilotless cargo planes. A large regional feeder airline for UPS and other overnight express carriers last week tentatively committed to buy 20 remote-controlled cargo planes with a novel design for middle miles delivery. Ameriflight, which flies 156 small turboprop aircraft daily to more than 200 destinations in the U.S. and the Caribbean, signed a letter of intent with San Diego-based Nautilus for 20 Kona feeder aircraft valued at $134 million. Nautilus is developing a family of pilotless aircraft it claims will increase cargo volume by 60% and cut carbon emissions in half, thereby making air shipments more affordable. The efficiency gains are possible because of carbon fiber composite airframes and a blended wing body, essentially a uniframe in which sections meld together that creates a more usable volume and better aerodynamics than a traditional airliner. The absence of pilots also leaves more room for cargo. The Kona is a short-haul feeder aircraft with a maximum payload of 4.7 tons in a 900-mile range designed to carry the equivalent of seven LD3-45 small shipping containers. It's powered by two rear propeller engines. The triangular blended wing body configuration is a departure from tube and wing aircraft which are loaded in a linear fashion. By rotating the cargo to 45 degrees, the diamond configuration maximizes space in the aircraft for more loading positions a highly desirable quality in an e-commerce error when light boxes fill up planes before their takeoff weight limit is reached. Traditional fuselage cross-sections are optimized for passengers with a circular design to aid cabin pressurization, but cargo naturally moves best in rectangular boxes or pallets. Fitting rectangular pallets in a circular fuselage section leaves plenty of empty space. A blended wing body configuration allows for a single rectangular cross-section and full utilization of the available volume. Ameriflight utilizes turboprop aircraft to connect rural areas to FedEx, DHL, and UPS air hubs in large cities and also offers on-demand expedited delivery services to logistics companies. In December 2021, Ameriflight reached an agreement providing Boston-based Merlin Labs access to its fleet for testing of its autonomous technology. Merlin software and hardware can control an aircraft without human intervention. From AINonline.com, Shelter partners with Sea Turtle Rescue Charity. Shelter has announced a partnership with Sea Turtle Rescue Charity Turtles Fly 2, under which the FBO chain will offer fuel discounts for pilots engaged in turtle transport flights. And by the way, that turtlesfly2.org website says their mission is to, quote, coordinate and facilitate the inclusion of GA in large-scale first responder relocation efforts. We engage GA pilots who contribute their expertise, aircraft fuel, and time, while leaving a lasting mark on endangered species rescue efforts. Going back to the article, when the weather turns colder along the eastern U.S., sea turtles swept north by the Gulf Stream become stranded on beaches as far as Cape Cod, Massachusetts. As water temperatures drop, these creatures become cold-stunned and are unable to survive unless they are quickly collected by animal rescue agencies and taken to local aquariums. 
Those facilities can soon become overwhelmed, and the turtles must then be swiftly transported to southern aquariums where they are rehabilitated and released back into the ocean. Since 2014, hundreds have been saved by volunteer turtle flyers who donate their time, aircraft, and fuel. While some individual shelter FBOs have waived fees in the past for such flights, the partnership formalizes the fuel discounts at all of its locations. And finally, this is our first story ever from GolfDigest.com. Plane forced to make emergency landing on a golf course, and golfers lend a hand. A group of Florida golfers had to deal with an unexpected hazard last week in the form of an airplane on the golf course, but they didn't let it ruin their round and even wound up getting an extra workout. The wild scene happened at Teltura Golf and Country Club in North Fort Myers, where a small plane was forced to make an emergency landing on the ninth green. Fortunately, no one was hurt, including the pilot who was the lone person on the aircraft. Ryan French posted on his Twitter account a message which he obtained from a witness on the scene. It said, He had just finished up and was waiting right by the ninth green for the group behind to finish. All of a sudden, he sees the plane coming in super low, no smoke, but it was loud. plane touched down safely and rolled all the way up on the green, stopping just before the pin. said it scared the crap out of the guys in the fairway as it basically buzzed their carts. Pilot got out after and explained he had engine trouble. Group needed to finish putting out, so they asked the pilot if they could push it out of the way, and they all helped. Now that's dedication to the game, and who says golf isn't a team sport? Anyway, we're glad no one was hurt and that no one's round of golf was spoiled. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up next, a few of my updates. And later, we'll talk with Tom Turner about why partial power failures are more dangerous than total engine failures. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And let's get to the good news. First, congratulations to my client, Patreon mega supporter Marlon Dutra, who just passed his multi-engine add-on to his commercial certificate. He did it in the Diamond DA42-6 that we have at the West Valley Flying Club here in Palo Alto, California. And Marlon currently owns a Cirrus SR20, and he has a DA62 Diamond, which is on order. And I'll be getting that in a couple months, so have fun with that, Marlon. And congratulations to patron supporter Chris Fenelon from Melbourne, Australia. He just passed his commercial. He says, Hi, Max. Love the show. I've been on board since episode one. I just passed my commercial and look forward to multi-engine and instrument ratings next. Keep up the great work. I take away something valuable from every show. You know what, Chris? That's the goal. I try to put in at least uh, one or two gold nuggets in there for everyone so that everybody learns at least something from each show. And congratulations to David Amato, who just did his first solo. That's exciting. I still remember mine from almost 50 years ago. He said, uh, while listening to liveatc.net for Burbank on Monday, February 6th, would have been around 10, 15 a.m., thought I heard a very familiar voice. My ears perked up as I thought I was hearing Max Trescott. If so, lucky catch. Hope you had a great flight. Amazing podcast and has become a great learning tool in my journey into aviation. I just did my first solo. Thank you, Max. And uh, sorry to say, David, that wasn't me. <laughs> though, though, though I have had people uh, you know, hear me on the air, so that's always kind of fun. And congratulations to Riley Smith over in North Carolina. He says, hey, Max, just wanted to share that back in December, I passed my ONP for airframe maintenance, and this week I received my ANP number. Fantastic. Riley, congratulations. I've always thought it would be fun to work on getting an ANP, but I know it takes, oh, many, many, many hours. So congratulations to you on doing that. And if you have some good news, please let me know. An easy way to do it, just go out to aviationnewstalk.com, click on contact at the top of the page, and that will come straight to me, and we'll share your good news. And here's a listener recording. Hey, Max. Good afternoon. This is R.E.R. I just listened to episode 220 when you spoke about seat rail and unintentional movement of the seat in any aircraft. When I took my commercial rating an exam in a beleaguered Piper Arrow, the seat rail and the locking mechanism was certainly challenged. So part of my MEL minimum equipment list was a block of foam that I had purchased to the dimension to keep, if I placed it behind the pilot seat, that seat in a permanent location. It did work out for me. The DE uh, passed comment on it before I placed it in. Why would I be bringing that piece of foam? And um, with its deployment behind the seat, 
he was rather impressed. I might have passed the commercial just for that reason. But listen, love your podcast, have supported it in the past, and will in the future. You have a great day and love the show. R.E.R., thanks for your recording. And yes, anything you can do to keep the seats from slipping is really, really important. My good friend Dan Rapp just got his SR20 back from a shop in Grass Valley, California, where they installed new seat rails because... We had that seat slip one time when we were doing power on stalls. That was a little disturbing to be in the right seat and watch Dan go back in the left seat as we already pitched up 15 to 20 degrees. So make sure you keep those seats from slipping. And if you'd like to send in a recording or a question, just go out to aviationnewstalk.com, click on listener questions at the top of the page where you can use our SpeakPipe app, and it'll send up to 90 seconds directly to me. And here's a preliminary NTSB report for a crash that was kind of mysterious to me, not obvious as to how this would have happened. This was a Phenom 300 jet. Now, these these are big personal jets. You don't expect these to go crashing. But on January 2nd of this year, at about 11.30 a.m. at Provo, Utah, according to the NTSB report, uh, the pilot sustained fatal injuries, two passengers sustained serious injuries, and one passenger sustained minor injuries. They say a witness who was removing snow from the ramp reported that the airplane was hangered near his location, that the airplane remained hangered until about 10.55, so just before the flight. The witness stated he watched the airplane be refueled and estimated that the pilot started the engines. At around 11.10 or 11.15 p.m., about the same time light snow began to fall. The fueler stated the accident airplane was parked in the hangar when he arrived to fuel the aircraft. About five minutes later, the pilot pulled the aircraft onto the ramp and the fueler repositioned his truck to refuel the plane with 350 gallons of Jet A. The fueler stated that while he was refueling the airplane, the pilot mentioned that they were trying to get out before the weather. The fueler added that while he added the fuel, he did a once-over and remembered observing unfrozen water droplets on the wings. After refueling, the fueler returned to the FBO. Upon exiting the fuel truck, he observed the aircraft taxi past his location. As he walked past the FBO, he heard the airplane and turned to watch it. The fueler stated that the airplane was starting its takeoff roll on runway 13 and appeared to pull up steep, roll to the left, and the left wing impacted the ground. The refueler stated that at the time of the accident, the precipitation was snow and a misty rain between light and medium intensity, along with a light breeze out of the north. Additional witnesses located at the airport observed the accident aircraft takeoff ascend to about 20 to 30 feet above ground level, and then both wings wobbled back and forth. The airplane banked right and then hard left as the left wing struck the ground. So a very unusual accident. I'm sure we'll learn more about this in the future. And last week I heard something interesting while listening to NorCal. They were clearing a number of airliners to go into San Jose International, and each of them was told to cross Clyde, which is an intersection that a number of instrument approaches start at, and then told clear for the instrument approach. (laughs) They didn't mention a specific instrument approach name, and I hadn't really heard that before from the controllers. I thought that sounded more efficient than, frankly, clearing them for a particular approach, because in the past, sometimes I've been cleared for approach A, and I told them, no, no, we we asked for approach B, and then they have to re-clear me for approach B. So I sent a note to a friend of mine who's a controller at NorCal. I said, hey, is this a new rule change? If so, what can you tell me about it? And the controller wrote back and said, it's a matter of controller preference technique, but many of us have been doing that, especially at San Jose for years. The 7110.65, which is essentially the controller handbook, allows for it. It gives the pilot latitude to fly whatever approach he or she would fly from that fix, excluding visual approaches. Technically, it should be something like November 123, cross collide at or above X thousand feet cleared for the approach. I never said nor was required to say instrument approach with the first clearance, but if the pilot got confused, then I would say that. With two different RNAV procedures and the ILS that has two sub varieties itself, going to runway 30 left, it was quicker to clear an aircraft for approach to runway 30 left than to ask the pilot which 30 left approach they wanted just to go right back and clear them for that approach. For us, all approaches to 30 left look the same on the radar. One snag with that technique is when a pilot reads back, Roger cleared visual approach 30 left when they didn't previously report the airport in sight. Then most controllers say something like, I didn't hear you report the airport in sight, cleared instrument approach 30 left. So to preempt that from happening, some may be saying instrument approach from the start. And I wrote back, 
Excellent. Thanks for all the good detail. When I heard it, I thought it made perfect sense. Over the years, I've heard lots of cleared for the ILS with a response, oh, we requested the RNAV. I love the simplicity of it. And the controller wrote back, yes, I was actually surprised it's allowed because the 7110.65 isn't very clear about it, but it has been blessed by our QA department and past muster doing routine facility audits. So there you go. And here's an email from Patreon supporter Philip Archambault. He's in Shanghai, so ni hao, Philip. He writes, hi, Max, on episode 260 about the impossible turn. Do you have any tips on potential air collision avoidance when returning to the takeoff runway or parallel runway facing taking off traffic? Thank you for the great show. I'm a loyal subscriber and listener. Well, thanks so much for your email. Uh, I think I would be pretty quick to say mayday, 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 engine failure, engine failure, Cessna returning to name of field. Please clear the pattern and the runways immediately and wish me luck. So yeah, I would say, you know, just go ahead and get the mayday out there. That's the most important thing. And I think that uh, if you ask people to quickly depart the pattern, everybody will do that for you. And here's an email from patron supporter David Speranza in Pennsylvania, my home state. He says, hi, Max. I recently listened to episode 260 with Rob Mark. I fly a 2003 Cirrus SR22, and I would appreciate your thoughts about flying at VX immediately after takeoff. Then at the usual VY once caps, that's the parachute altitude is attained. I've always been taught to fly at VY except in a short field environment. I've been a paid transporter for a while and seem to learn something with each episode. That's great. Thanks so much for supporting the show, David. And I would say that there's no one right answer to this question, but my goal when I'm flying a Cirrus is to get above that minimum altitude for using the parachute as quickly as possible. And the reason I want to do that is I want to get to that altitude quickly because at my home airport, there's just no good place to land if I have to land straight ahead. There's essentially nothing but marsh lines in front of me with hardly any solid surfaces there. So I try to minimize my time below the minimum altitude at which I can pull that parachute. Now, I've used a stopwatch both in the SR-20 and the SR-22 many times. And here's what I found with the SR-20. If I do a short field takeoff and climb at VX to 500 feet, I'll get to 500 feet about 12 seconds sooner than if I take off, raise the flaps, and climb at VY. In an SR-22, the difference between these two takeoff techniques is smaller, maybe about five seconds, and it's still faster to climb at VX up to 500 or sometimes 600 feet, depending upon which model aircraft you have. Now, if my home field were much longer, I don't know, maybe 6,000 feet or longer, I'd probably just climb out at VY. But I think there are two trade-offs in my mind. At the VX climb speed, I have a smaller margin above stall speed, so I have to fly more precisely and can't afford to get slow. Also, it's pretty clear now that the parachute fills more quickly at higher air speeds. So ideally, one would like to be at a higher speed, such as VY instead of VX, if they had to pull the parachute. Anyway, those are the trade-offs in my mind. I hope that helps. And this is probably my favorite email of the week. It comes from Jason Morse out of Fort Bragg, California, which is a lovely area along the coast of Northern California. He writes, Hi, Max. A couple of years ago, you dined at McCallum House Inn, and you started up a conversation with my 15-year-old son, Sam, who was working as a busboy. I'm not sure how the conversation started, but you learned that he was an aspiring pilot, and you told him of your podcast. He shared the podcast with me, and I've been an avid listener. I love it. Anyway, Sam is now a senior in high school and has about 34 hours of training in and has applied to colleges with aviation programs. We are heading out to a couple of college visits this spring. His goal is to be a commercial airline pilot. His love of aviation rubbed off on me, and I'm now working on my private pilot license as well. I have about 25 hours in and now own part of a Cessna 150. Anyway, just wanted to drop you a line to let you know that I love your work and look forward to listening to your show each week. Hoping to become a Patreon supporter soon. Keep up the great work, Jason. <laughs> well, just a quick hello and shout out to to both uh, Sam and Jason. Glad to hear that you're both uh, loving flying up there along the beautiful northern coast of uh, California. And for folks who haven't been there, it's um, it's a fairly rural area. It's not like the, some of the other crowded areas of uh California, and it's just a nice, uh, you know, temperate, very cool environment because uh, it never gets particularly hot because of the uh, cold ocean being right there. So, wonderful part of the world. And here's an email from Stan in Idaho. He writes, I get to spend a bit of time doing activities where I can listen to podcasts, and I found yours to be helpful. 
especially those that discuss IFR procedures. There was an episode in which you discussed the qualities needed for a cockpit headlamp. Now, that was episode 57 in which I bought about half a dozen different headlamps and analyzed them, and I didn't really find one that I thought was perfect, unfortunately. Uh, but Stan writes that the Black Diamond Cosmo 300 may check all the boxes. He says if you set it up for a minimized red light, turn it off. When you turn it back on, it goes to the last setting, uh, red light at last intensity. If you want a bright white light, you can cycle through the three lamps using the left button, and you'll have more light than you need for pre-flighting or pushing an airplane back into a dark hangar. This lamp takes three AAA batteries. It will also easily go into lockout mode so you don't pull the headlight out the next time you need it and find it has accidentally turned itself on and drained the batteries. Holding both buttons down at the same time changes lockout mode status. Stan, thanks so much for passing that along. And Patreon supporter Nathan Ballard writes, just wanted to drop a note of appreciation for the wonderful podcast. I had a question this week from a student about airworthiness regarding a 172 and the stall warning requirement. I found the episode because I remember the discussion. I said, why don't we take a listen to Max and Seth Lake talk about the stall horn? A few minutes of listening from my student and me again, and there was the answer. Great stuff. Thanks for giving so much time to the aviation family. Well, Nathan, thanks so much. And thanks so much for supporting the show as well. And from new Patreon supporter John Siegel, way up there in South Dakota, he says, Hi, Max. I just became an $8 a month member. I wanted to support one of the best podcasts out there, and I appreciate every episode. I will start my private pilot training at the beginning of April 2023, and I'm in my mid-50s. It's never too late, right? And I look forward to future podcasts. John, thanks so much for that. And now let's see if you know any of these other people like John who've chosen to support the show. First, let me mention more about Renato Steinberg. I mentioned one or two weeks ago that he had edited his pledge up to $50 a month, making him a mega supporter. And he's the founder and CEO of a customizable credit card called Clutch. That's with a K. To find out just what that meant, customizable credit card, I went out to their website, which gave a lot of examples. My favorite, never pay past the free trial again. Create a card number that only works for a single transaction so you can prevent further charges. That's pretty cool. So anyway, if you go out to their website at clutchcard.com, starts with a K, Renato said that he'll give listeners who sign up a one-time $20 credit if they use the promo code MAX, which shouldn't be too hard to remember. And my thanks to these other members who've signed up in the past week. They include Miguel Pinho, John Siegel, Richard Curtin, and Mitchell Tompkins, who all signed up at the $8 a month level. And Rex McDaniel signed up at $20 a month. And Ryan Blanding edited his pledge up to $20 a month, so they'll both get access to the videos that I post regularly to the website. And thanks to John Ebner and Carlos Dominguez, who signed up at $35 a month level, so they'll also get access to my online courses. And special thanks to Michelle Perrine. She has signed up through PayPal to make a monthly donation of $15 a month. Thank you so much, Michelle. And if you've been thinking, yeah, I really like this show, I get a lot out of it, and I'd like to do my part to help support it because it's a listener-supported show, and after all, you are a listener. Two easy ways to sign up to support the show and join the club. One is go out to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, where you can sign up at different monthly donation levels, and you can also read on the website all the goodies you'll get for the different levels. Or you can make a one-time donation by going out to aviationnewstalk.com slash PayPal. And thanks so much for your support. Coming up next, our conversation with Tom Turner about why partial engine failures are more dangerous than total engine failures. All right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. And now let me tell you a little about Tom Turner. Tom spent six years in the Air Force where he was a Minuteman Missile Combat Crew Commander. Later, he earned a master's degree in aviation safety. He's held a number of flying jobs since then, including a five-year period when he was a lead instructor at Flight Safety International, responsible for all factory-approved training for the Beach Bonanza. In 2003, he became the Manager of Technical Services for the American Bonanza Society, and he's currently the Executive Director of the American Bonanza Society's Air Safety Foundation. He holds an ATP and was named the 2010 National FAA Safety Team Rep of the Year and was inducted into the Flight Instructor Hall of Fame in 2015. And stick around to the very end because after we talk with Tom, 
I'm going to read from an article that AOPA columnist Barry Schiff wrote about a partial power accident that could have turned out better. Now here's our conversation with Tom Turner. Well, Tom, welcome to the show. Great to have you back. Thanks for asking me to come back, uh, Max. I listened to you and Rob and uh, was intrigued and it led to this. So thank you. <laughs> well, that's exactly what I want to mention. You emailed me about episode 260 in which we talked about when to attempt the impossible turn. And you said in your email, outstanding discussion on engine failure. And he's, then you mentioned that there was a study by the ATSB, the Australian Transport Safety Bureau, that was relevant. Tell us about that study. Well, uh, ATSB uh, is phenomenal. They, they put out some excellent training materials that derive from accident reports. Uh, in the U.S., I think the NTSB, it, it's fairly analogous to what AOPA's, our Safety Institute, does with NTSB reports, except it's done by the government entity. I, I actually was honored to be able to take a high-level tour of the ATSB's facility in um, in Australia several years ago, uh, got to see the QF32 engine, if you remember that story about the Airbus, all torn down and, and all. But uh, in this particular study, uh, they look at their ATSB accident report history involving engine failures in single engine aircraft. And they, they come up with some very, very interesting data, at least I think it's interesting, uh, that uh, points to some things that we rarely, if ever, train for in most pilot training. Yeah, partial power loss, which of course is uh, something people don't usually think about. They usually think about total engine failure. What did they find? Well, the most interesting overall fact is that uh, they found uh, from a deep dive into their own accident records that accidents resulting in partial power loss happen three times more often than accidents resulting from total power loss. And so it points to a great many things we can do and think about to prepare for and detect partial power loss. And it really is a call for pilot, for instructors to teach partial power loss scenarios, which we rarely teach. Yeah, the numbers were interesting. They said that in a 10-year period that there were 242 occurrences of partial engine power loss, of which nine of them were fatal. And they said there were 75 occurrences of total power loss, of which none of them were fatal. Why do you suppose people are more likely to get in trouble with a partial power loss? Well, uh, I think it's simply uh, detecting that a problem has really occurred and then dealing with the confusion of an airplane or an engine that is performing in some way. It's not the, oh, your engine is dead scenario that we're all taught to react to. Uh, there's a graph in this uh, in this study that it graphs uh, from zero power remaining to 100 percent power remaining the uh, risk based on the outcome of actual accidents and toward the high end of power loss. I mean, if, if your engine goes away completely, you don't have a lot of uh, things to choose from in a single engine airplane. Uh, you know, where you go, that's, that's part of the discussion, but you recognize very rapidly that the, uh, the power is gone and you need to do something about it. When there's very, very little power loss, you may not recognize right away that something has happened, but the power loss isn't significant enough that you, you can't fly the airplane, at least uh, you know, try to you know, claw your way up to pattern altitude or something like that. So the risk, as they see it, of making a bad decision or not making a decision at all is fairly low on either end of the spectrum. Either the decisions made for you with total power loss or nearly total power loss, or you it, it there aren't two terrible adverse consequences of not making a decision if you've got most of your power remaining. In the middle, from about 30% to about 60 to 70% of power loss, you lose about half your power. Again, the, the way the Australians put it, I love it. They call this the region of heightened uncertainty. And what they mean by that is 
you know something's wrong, but it doesn't match any of your prior training as to what an engine failure is like. And so you don't know what to do about it. And that's where people tend to have trouble and lose control of the airplane. Yeah, I think this exactly mirrors uh, what we discussed in episode 261 last week, which was the a bonanza that uh, crashed in Westchester, where the gentleman took off from JFK, knew shortly after takeoff that there was some problem, uh, but it was 20 minutes into the flight before he declared an emergency. I watched a, a video last night in preparation for our conversation today. That was really excellent. I'll include a link to it in the show notes. It was put out by the Air Safety Foundation, and in it, uh, Richard McSpadden was interviewing the pilot of a P-51 that had a partial power loss uh, in the U.K., did an off-airport landing. And one of the comments that they made was, uh, by the way, this engine was cutting in and cutting out. And they said that uh, they felt that this type of situation was more dangerous because the mind goes back and forth between I can make it, I can't make it, I'm in an engine out best field scenario to I can make the airport scenario. And I think that kind of illustrates the uncertainty that you're talking about. Exactly. You know, well, did you learn about partial power loss in your private pilot training? I certainly did not. The, the closest analogy might be uh, intellectual discussion of carburetor icing scenarios, but I don't remember my instructor even pulling the carb heat and letting me experience that loss of power on takeoff. Uh, we just don't, uh, we don't think about it very much. Yeah, I agree. This is not something that I've given much thought to, not something that the, the training that we run across or the magazine articles that we run across uh, speak to very much. I thought it was fascinating that they found that there was a, a 3x uh, difference between partial power and full power situations. Let's just go ahead and uh, talk about our own experiences briefly. What are the numbers for you in terms of partial power losses versus full complete power loss? I've had five engine power loss events in my almost 5,000, I should pass 5,000 total time this year. So uh, about 1,000 hours, every 1,000 hours, uh, they weren't spaced evenly. One of them was a total power loss. The other four were significant, but partial power losses. Right. The score for me, by the way, is uh, three to zero. So I've had three partial power events and no, knock on wood, <laughs> I don't want to jinx anything here, no complete uh, engine failure uh, events. Uh, so let's talk about, for, for example, uh, when you were in the Baron uh, taking off. Tell us about that. Yeah, a couple of my partial power losses were during takeoff, and the one in the Baron was the one that was most um, potentially hazardous. I was instructing in a Beach Model 55 Baron. It was the first time I'd flown with this individual, and it was the first takeoff with this individual. We briefed uh, pretty extensively ahead of time. He was uh, from a uh, Latin American country, and there might have been a little bit of a language issue there as well. But I brief uh, about uh, rejected takeoffs. Uh, one of the hazards, if you will, of uh, instructing in beach barons is virtually none of them have brakes on the instructor side of the airplane. So part of the briefing is if I tell you break, 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 that means you pull the power back and apply maximum braking. Uh, we began our takeoff roll off of about a 4,000 foot runway. During the takeoff roll, the right engine, if I remember correctly, it was the right engine uh, wasn't achieving full fuel flow. And uh, the, the pilot was you know, fighting a little bit to keep it on the center, center line, but he was able to do so. Uh, as we had discussed, he was aggressively guarding the throttles in the full position, and I started to tell him, break, 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 and he was not break, break, breaking. Uh, eventually, as the end of the runway was coming near, I reached up and pulled the mixture controls on both engines and just shut them down there, and we rolled to a stop before we went off the runway. But uh, clearly, we had some sort of... Uh, fuel-related partial power loss on takeoff, and we were able to reject the takeoff. Yeah, glad that worked out. Of my three events, one was also a rejected takeoff. It occurred back around, oh, I'd say 1980, 1981, early in my piloting career when I was working at my first uh, job with HP in New Jersey. And I was uh, taking off out of Hackettstown in a Cessna 172, which I remember at the time 
was the least expensive 172 for rent anywhere that I could find. Now, that might be part of the reason we had the issue, but I still remember it was $35 an hour uh, versus around $50 an hour for, for most other uh, 172s. Anyway, I had my uh, coworker, uh, Charlie Rothschild, on board, and Charlie at the time had more flying experience than I did. We went to take off. And we were just not developing, you know, full power. And he was the one who said, hey, you know, you might want to stop it or you might want to <laughs> reject this takeoff. And we did. And we taxied back and this time uh, tried it and it worked. And so, you know, I had to kind of think now in the same situation, would I have tried it the, the second time? I'm not sure that I would. But clearly there was there was something going on there that was intermittent that, you know, cleared itself. Maybe it was carburetor ice. I mean, who knows? But clearly, rejected takeoffs are something that people should be thinking about and should be practicing. Well, and even on the uh, the Part 121 commercial level, commercial airline level, um, there's quite a bit of current discussion about proper training, rejected takeoff techniques. And, and we again, we don't spend a great deal of time doing that. I, I probably did two or maybe maybe three rejected takeoffs in the process of my private pilot training, if that, but certainly wasn't something that I, I did on any sort of regular basis to develop a, a recurrent um, proficiency with it. Well, so let's go ahead and take a look at the pie chart, figure one uh, that they have here in the ATSB report. It says initial actions taken, taken by pilots after a partial power loss. So basically what they analyzed is what is it that people did after that particular power loss. Tell us about the uh, the different segments there, starting from the, the biggest one down to the smaller ones. The bigger one, by a substantial margin, looking at the graph, uh, you know, it's roughly two-thirds of all of the events. 160 of their events involve turning back toward the departure aerodrome or, or the airport. Now, again, Australianism, it's called an aerodrome down there. Four of those were fatal. Five uh, resulted in serious injuries. And so roughly nine of the 160 resulted in death or probably a life-changing event for the person or persons on board. Uh, but uh, they, strangely enough, the greatest, the, you know, the of those, 151 successfully returned to the airport or whether it was on the runway or on the airport grounds, they're not uh, exactly precisely defining. But uh, there were a surprising number of successful turnbacks. Yeah. And in this particular case, a definition of success is they didn't have serious injuries or they weren't killed. Yes, so. yes, yes. Yes. And I talk to people about that uh, when I talk about turnbacks also, for, for example, in retractable gear airplanes, if the gear is up, leave the gear up. The measure of success is that you and your passengers can, can get out of the aircraft under your own power. Uh, whether or not you're in the infield or on the runway or the gear is up or the gear is down is ir irrelevant to what I would call being successful. Right. It also doesn't matter if the airplane's usable again <laughs> afterwards. That would still be successful in, in my That's, mind as well. I want to make one very important point about all of these statistics regarding, especially regarding successful turnback maneuvers. In almost all discussions of engine failure on takeoff and an attempt to get back to the runway, we are talking about total loss of engine power. This particular report, all of the numbers are about situations where you have some power, maybe even some substantial amount of power that will help you maintain airspeed and altitude and reduce your rate of descent during those turns. So just because 160 of these events resulted in a successful turn back and there were only nine fatalities or serious injury accidents as a result doesn't mean that that is reflective of the, the issue that we almost always talk about, which is total loss of power after takeoff. Yes. And so with partial power, you would expect more people to attempt to turn back. Also, since Australia has a disproportional number of uh, micro light aircraft, they're certainly going to be able to make it turn back at lower altitudes than the larger aircraft that we have here in the U.S., so tell us about the next section of the pie chart. The next level, 48 of them involved forced or precautionary landings, and this would be somewhere off of the aerodrome ground. So this is the land straight, straight ahead sort of thing. One of those had a fatality, and two of them had 
serious injuries. So three out of the 48 were a, uh, a fatality or a life-changing medical event. Again, uh, no word as to the state of the aircraft, and that's really irrelevant to what we're trying to accomplish here. The next level below that, uh, 24 of them were successful rejected takeoffs, no serious or fatal injuries. That's a good thing to, to have in your ha- uh, your back pocket, reject the takeoff. I think that's the one that, well, besides the, the 160 being such a large percentage of the pie, that was surprising to me. The fact that there were zero uh, serious or fatal injuries with rejected takeoffs, to me, really stood out. Because what that says is, when you decided to reject the takeoff, you were relatively slow, at least compared to the speed you'd be in the air, uh, and that you probably had some opportunity to break. Maybe you ended up hitting something. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you went off the runway. Maybe you didn't. But everybody walked away with no serious injuries. And I think in the report, they also talked about how if more people had done rejected takeoffs, kept that airplane on the ground and hadn't just kept going. In fact, I think they mentioned that uh, some of the people kind of sensed that, yeah, I kind of thought there was something wrong before the takeoff, but I, but I just kind of continued as if, well, maybe it will get better. I mean, in your experience, when you have engine problems, do they usually get better? Uh, not, not spontaneous, uh, repair. No, that's, that's very, very rare. And, you know, this all goes back to the, uh, the tenets we talk about in any engine failure in flight scenario that your, your objective is to land the airplane wings level under control at the slowest safe speed. Well, uh, if the engine failure has occurred during, on the runway during the takeoff roll, Fly the airplane means bring it to a stop there, and clearly that seems to be a uh, a successful outcome in the way we're defining success uh, in ATSB's experience all of the time. The final level was no apparent action was taken by the pilot. Uh, We could talk about that, I suppose, but there were four fatalities in that case as well. So almost half of the situations where... uh, it, they couldn't tell if the pilot did anything at all except maybe tense up and, and stall and spin it in or who knows what. Obviously, that's not going to work out well for people. Yeah, that was what we would talk about as resignation, one of the hazardous attitudes. They just either were so stunned by what was going on or didn't have a clue as to what to do next. They apparently just kind of kept flying you know, straight ahead until either they hit terrain or they lost control and you know spun out of the skies. So clearly they were you know, getting slower, but they weren't doing anything about it. So I think probably one of the most important things to take away from this is not only should we be planning for these events, but when they occur, do something. Do something. Yeah, you're going to get started. Well, it's, it's interesting because, you know, the, all of the this study that we're talking about involves single engine airplanes. But uh, you can talk about the differences between an engine failure in a single and an engine failure in a twin. In a multi-engine airplane, if you lose power shortly after takeoff when the other one's operating at a high power level, unless you almost instantly correctly intervene, the airplane's going to depart from controlled flight on all three axes. In other words, unless you do everything right, it's going to go out of control. In a single-engine airplane, if you lose an air uh, lose an engine, it's naturally going to pitch down, which is what you probably want to have happen in that case. And it will attempt to do at least a rough idea of what it should initially do unless you actively resist it. And the problem is, if, you are, uh, if you're unprepared, your natural reaction might be to clench down on the controls and try to keep the nose looking like it you think it should in that climb attitude, and it, it goes bad very, very quickly. So I am not advocating just letting the plane do what it wants to do, but if, if you make use of the airplane's natural tendency when you have a loss of power in a single-engine airplane, it's going to at least trend in the right direction. Yeah, the thing that really struck me about the no apparent action was the, the high fatality rate. So 40% of the people who did nothing died and you look at all the other segments, you know, for example, the biggest one, 160. Well, we had nine out of 160, which um, quick math, that's a little more than 5%. Let's call that, you know, six or, you know, 7%. Uh, also for the, the straight ahead, uh, you know, somewhat similar kinds of uh, numbers, six, 7%, three out of uh, 48. 
what that tells you is if you're stuck between deciding, do I land straight ahead or do I turn back? Either one of those is far better than doing nothing. <laughs> because if you do nothing, boy, high probability, it's not going to work out. And this report uses a lot of data. I love the data because I've not seen this type of data done in the U.S. Uh, but it's all substantiation for an educational message. And there's quite a bit in this. It's like a 33-page document. There's quite a bit in this document about ways to detect engine failure, to pre-flight an airplane in anticipation of finding something that might be a failure. And the third bullet point that they use is, quote, taking positive action and maintaining aircraft control. Whether you decide to land straight ahead or you attempt to make a return either to the runway or at least the flat spot of the terrain of the airport that surrounds the runway environment, as long as you maintain control of the aircraft and you impact, uh, at, again, that's the way I've always put it, wings level under control at the slowest safe speed, all of these options where the pilot did something were highly survivable events. So let's talk a little bit about the next graph, uh, number two, which is a, a bar chart. And I found this fascinating again as well. At an altitude of partial engine power loss were known. So they didn't know the altitude for all of these actions taken in general landing position. And the way they've divided this chart up is the y-axis is altitude. So for every 250 feet, they've got a, a bar uh, and then they tell us the total number of events uh, at that. So working from the surface, uh, tell us uh, what altitude, you know, how many of these events happened at various altitudes? Well, we've got about 23 events uh, that happened on the runway in the surface and, uh, well, probably 24 because there were 24 rejected takeoffs in that pie chart that we talked about there. And, uh, you know, they, one of them, it appears, maybe one off the end of the runway, but most of them appears to appear, appear to have come to a stop on the pavement. But that one's that. Um, between the runway and 250 feet above ground level, uh, we have about 60 events, and we have uh, the majority of them appear to have recovered on the pavement straight ahead, or, or in many cases, these were some of these turn back maneuvers. And again, it's not clear whether in turning back, they actually, they say on the aerodrome, not on the runway. So it's not clear whether they actually made it back to the pavement from which they departed, or uh, if it was an event like uh, you and Robert were talking about in the earlier broadcast, where the best option is to make a 180 and land in the grass alongside the runway or on a parallel runway or parallel taxiway, or maybe even a shallower turn and, and land on some other surface that isn't 180 degrees from your takeoff path. But they were overwhelmingly successful in those cases as well. The next level up from 250 to 500 feet up, we have uh, quite a few turnbacks that appear to have been successful and quite a few turnbacks. It says turnback off aerodrome, so they may be meaning the runway there, but I've never been able to distinguish, and I've asked some question whether they were talking about on the runway or not. Uh, the problem is that I found this particular study many years after I saw it, actually after I toured the facility in Australia, and uh, some of the authors, uh, you know, they've long since retired, and they're, they're trying to figure out exactly what they meant by that as well. As you get up to higher altitudes, 500 to 750 feet up, they tend to uh, turn back uh, onto the aerodrome or turn back off aerodrome, mainly successful, and then it's just a smattering event of events higher than that. But uh, I, I thought that this was really fascinating that, uh, as you said, the engine failures are occurring below 500 feet, and so many of them appear to have made a turn back even from those altitudes, which goes against what I teach. It goes against what you and Rob seem to be concluding in your earlier broadcast, and it may be very, very type specific. You, there are a lot of light sport airplanes used in Australia. It might be uh, a matter of uh, very slow um, stalling or gliding speeds and 
slow touchdown speeds and and consequently low stresses on the uh, occupants when it touches down. I went through and tried to estimate, since this is a bar chart, the exact number of uh, events in each of these bars. And I put together a little spreadsheet. And what I found was that about uh, 12% of them were on the surface. Uh, in the next bar up, it was 32%, which means that cumulatively 45% of the events happened below 250 feet. At, uh, for the next bar up, we had 64 events. That was 35% of the total, which means cumulatively by the time we reach 500 feet, that was 80% of all of the events. So I was really stunned at how close to the surface the majority of these events occurred. I think a lot of us kind of think, oh, when something happens, we'll be up at a nice high altitude. It's like, no, actually, <laughs> you're probably going to be down at a, oh my gosh, uh, type of altitude when this occurs. In terms of uh, the results that uh, uh, people took or the actions they took at the surface, all of those were rejected takeoffs below 250 feet. Surprisingly, 52% of them were turnbacks. Now, I think that probably goes to what your comment was about micro lights. You're going to have a much better chance of turning back uh, if you're in a micro light at 250 feet than if you are in a typical uh, single engine aircraft. So I would not you know, generalize that data to the kinds of airplanes we're flying here in the U.S. As you would expect, as you get up higher from 250 to 500 feet, 88% of the aircraft did uh, turnbacks. And of course, they have data here that shows which ones were successful and which weren't and so on. But I think the key takeaway is, boy, you better be prepared for that engine failure pretty close to the surface. And it would certainly make sense to know ahead of time exactly what you're going to do if your engine failure occurs within that first, I don't know, 30 seconds, 45 seconds of takeoff. Yeah, well, you know, putting that in perspective, if, if an engine failure is going to happen within 250 feet of the surface, that's less than... 10 wingspans. And it's about the time when, you know, if I'm doing this in a bonanza, it's about the time I'm uh, somewhere in there when I'm reaching over and retracting the landing gear. Uh, or if you're using flaps on takeoff in some other airplane, it's about the point. It, it doesn't wait until we're after, we're done with all of those immediate post liftoff events. It happens right now. And so you do need to back up and try to predict or detect is probably the better word, whether or not your engine is developing power. That's one of the things that the report goes into as well. Well, I think a, another key thing from the study is that they say that most fatal and serious injury accidents after partial power loss are avoidable. And they found a number of these accidents where if people had only done things a little bit differently, uh, they might have avoided the situation. Let's talk about uh, the first item they talk about, which is pre-flight decision-making and planning for emergencies and abnormal situations for the particular airport that you're taking off from. Talk about some of the kinds of things people want to be thinking about before they actually take off from a particular airport. Well, in addition to all of the inspections of the airplane itself and, and actually monitoring the engine during the takeoff roll, which we may come back to, one of the things you, you need to know is what is normal for this takeoff? What's your expectation for this takeoff? Uh, roughly how much runway distance am I going to take to lift off? What sort of initial climb attitude am I aiming for to get the airspeed I want? Uh, what sort of initial climb rate am I going to get? And if you have an idea, it, it, it's not nearly as critical when you're taking off from your home airport all the time with the airplane at a weight that you normally operate at all the time, where at least in NTSB records, it usually shows to be a problem is when somebody decides to operate the airplane much heavier than they're used to or at a higher density altitude than is normal for them. And they don't they don't have a good idea of what the expectations are, and uh, they know it's not going to perform as well as it will at lighter weights or, or at a lower density altitude, but they don't know how it's going to perform. And if there is a problem, they don't detect that it's performing even worse than it should. 
into those conditions. So having an idea, especially when you get outside of your normal zone of operation of what the takeoff performance is going to be is, is a very good thing. The second and probably more uh, at least as important thing is to have a predetermined idea where you're going to go if there's a problem. And whether that be a return to the air, airfield, I think you and Rob discussed that quite well in the earlier event that uh, there may be options, but you have to be very well practiced at executing those options. Uh, but uh, it's easy now to go on Google Earth and take a look at what's off the end of this unfamiliar airport for you. Uh, I brief it pretty extensively when I take off out of my home airfield here with student, well, with myself, but also with students. If we lose an engine on takeoff and we go straight ahead, we end up, end up in a rheumatology clinic, and that's not good for anybody. But in our on our particular runway, if I make about a 20-degree turn to the left, then I have some really good options. So I know before I ever begin the takeoff roll that if I lose power, I'm going to make a slight turn to the left, level the wings, and, and keep it under control and, and put it down. But make these sorts of decisions. Keep those sorts of things in the back of your head because you're not going to have time to assess the the information and make that decision in the first 250 feet after liftoff. Yeah, I think that's the key takeaway from this study is that 250 feet. I think a lot of people think, oh, I'll just look for a field. No, you need to know where that field is before you take off because that field is probably going to be pretty darn close to the airport. And a lot of airports are hemmed in by all kinds of obstacles and buildings. So yeah, you really need to figure that out ahead of time. Now, one of the things that I do when I'm taking off, and this is a habit that I've only formed probably in the last uh, eight or 10 years, and that is that on the takeoff roll, first thing I'm looking for is fuel flow. Because I know in the uh, aircraft that I fly regularly what that fuel flow should be, at least at the my home sea level airport. And that has caught so many situations of, oh, the mixture wasn't all the way forward or you know, various other things like the throttle wasn't all the way forward. So I find that's a really quick way to assess, hey, are we getting normal performance out of this uh, engine? After that, I'm looking for any warning messages and then looking to make sure that the airspeed is alive. And we will have a brief ahead of time that if we have any issues on the runway, we're going to pull the throttle to idle. Years ago, as we were doing um, pre-takeoff briefings, I would say if the engine quits on the runway, pull throttle to idle. Then I realized, no, wait a minute. <laughs> We, we want to pull throttle to idle for just about anything that's a problem on the runway. So I think people need to realize that you know, if things are not looking good, you're already in a really nice, safe place, which is the runway. So pull the throttle you know, before things you know, before you get higher up and things could get worse. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I look for fuel flow at the beginning of the – and see, that's another thing you need to know ahead of time what normal will be. Uh, and that helps a lot in uh, a high-density altitude takeoff to, to know what normal is going to be so that you can lean for it as appropriate. But I check uh, fuel flow, oil temperature, and oil pressure at throttle application, uh, airspeed coming alive. And then I like to call out at about 40 knots indicated, again, fuel flow, oil temperature, oil pressure. Because if one of those is lacking at that point or excessive at that point, you're still, at least in, you know, the Bonanzas and Barons I fly, you're still well below liftoff speed, and you can, you can uh, make a quick uh, rejected takeoff there without uh, being anywhere close to, to liftoff speed in the airplane. So I double-check it at about 40 knots. There's also the 70-50 uh, the rule. You should be at about 70% of your liftoff speed at halfway on uh, down your computed uh, takeoff distance. And I know uh, from some training I took in a Cirrus simulator, the Cirrus uh, owner's organization tends to teach a time to, uh, to time to airspeed. And that works out really well in the beach airplanes as well. Uh, about 10 seconds to about 50 knots works really well in pretty much all the iterations of the plane I fly, as long as I am at a relatively low density altitude. Take that to Colorado Springs on the summertime and the 10-second uh, the rule doesn't work. And so you have to figure out distances and, and cross checks a different way. But uh, I, one of the most common things that I see lacking in pilots that I train 
is any suggestion that they are evaluating the operation of the engine during the takeoff roll. And so uh, this report and what we're talking about and what a lot of instructors teach is just check to make sure that the power you're getting is the power you think you're getting before you're 250 feet in the air and you realize that it's not. One of the things that really surprised me was they talked about a number of cases where people detected problems or during the uh, the run-up, and yet they continued anyway. Interestingly, we've got a news story uh, that we just talked about earlier in this episode in which uh, an aircraft in North Carolina had had problems. Low-time pilot had about five weeks of, of flying time as a private pilot, and the mechanic told him, hey, sorry, I guess changing the plugs didn't fix it. Don't fly it. And yet he, he flew it, you know, and, and that, was, uh, that was the end. So they said in this report, some of the examples of uh, partial power loss events uh, where the engine condition could have been detected by an RPM change during the engine run-up were fouled spark plugs, and they said at least 19 cases, carburetor icing, at least 11 suspected cases, and other carburetor problems, at least 11 cases. To me, this says people either are not paying a whole lot of attention to what the engine performance is during the run-up, or they're not doing the run-up, or they're somehow thinking that, well, it's not that bad. I guess I can go with it. Why do you think someone might go ahead and fly anyway, even if it's apparent to them that the engine isn't working quite right? Well, I think we're goal-oriented people, and there's expectation bias. And you know, I've been in Cessna 172s. The, the old carbureted 172s were really bad for following up the plugs during taxi out. And you do the run up and the mag check is, uh, the mag check isn't any good. And so the instructor says, well, just lean it out and uh, we'll, we'll run it with a real lean for about 20 seconds and that'll clean up the plugs. Well, was that really the problem? We don't know for certain, but, but we tend to feel like, well, um, It's going to fly fine. We want to go where we're going. Going all of the way back to your very first flying lesson, with the possible exception uh, of if you did this in a tailwheel airplane, the very first time you ever took off in an airplane, you applied the power, you worked the rudders, you pulled the stick back when the instructor told you to put the stick back, and with the obvious oversight of the flight instructor, you are left with the impression that you took off the airplane, you made the airplane take off the very first time you flew it. And I don't know if that sets us up for feeling like that's the easiest thing in the world. We just put the throttle forward and we go. And for the rest of our flying lives, we don't think very much about that. But in any event, to, to deeper psychological things, I guess, you know, we, we want to fly the airplane. And we tend to very, very easily explain away in our mind any discrepancies because we want to fly the airplane. And it hasn't happened to me before, and therefore it's not going to happen now. It's easy, it's quick, but it's vital that we check that the engine is actually performing the way we expect it to. And if there's, if we do detect a, an abnormality during the engine run-up, that's why we do engine run-ups. We don't do it just to, just to go out there and sit and, and burn a few petrochemicals in the run-up area. We do it because we are checking to make sure this thing is working correctly before we attempt to take off. And if you find something wrong, that's the time to find it, not 250 feet in the air. Yes, I agree with uh, your your thoughts about the motivations for pilots to continue uh, anyway. I think as a group, pilots tend to be optimist. We like to believe that things are going to work out. Otherwise, we wouldn't go into these airplanes to begin with. I think we tend to uh, deny that things bad things could happen to us, that the bad things happen just to the other pilots that we read about. And I think also there's kind of the perceived inconvenience of, oh, Now I'm going to have to find a mechanic and gee, it's a Saturday or a Sunday and there might not be one available or I, I'm at, uh, not at my home airport. Boy, this is going to be a huge inconvenience. All I can say is, you know, funerals are much more inconvenient than all of those things. Yeah, you're right. And, and you, you, you said you, you triggered a memory when you said we're optimists. I I wrote an article for AOPA pilot 
two, three decades ago, uh, co-wrote it with a gentleman named uh, Lauren Sharon. And, and the title of the article is Pilots are Optimists, Pilots are Pessimists. And, and we were talking about this exact thing. When we're put in a training environment, especially if you're in a more advanced training environment, you know, you're, you're in a simulator training or something like that, we tend to be very pessimistic. We, we, we spent the entire training session looking for things that are wrong because we know they're going to happen and we don't want to miss them. We don't want to get, we don't want the instructor to think, oh, he missed that indication. So we're, we're very, very pessimistic. But take that same pilot out of the simulator and immediately put them in the airplane and they tend to be very optimistic. The airplane's going to perform well and I'm going to perform very well. And if there anything goes wrong, hey, I just took the training, I can handle it. So I don't have to worry too much about it. Tom, this has really been great. Take a moment and tell folks about your weekly newsletter and how they can sign up for that. Okay. I do a blog called uh, Flying Lessons Weekly. It comes out usually Wednesday or Thursday nights. I often quote Max in it, and, and he sometimes quotes me here. But uh, I've done this for, for over 30 years in one form or another. But what I do with uh, Flying Lessons is I look at the mishaps that we collectively are talking about. And we don't know at this very early stage uh, in in investigation. Really, the investigation usually hasn't even begun yet. So I can't tell you definitively that in this particular accident, preliminary accident report, this is what happened. I go well out of my way not to say that. But what I do th say is, okay, we see these initial facts and that allows us to think, you know, it could have been A, B, C, or D, let's talk about one or two of those things this week. So in Flying Lessons, it's a blog, and I just write some of my thoughts after hearing what we are all talking about that week. And then I get a lot of uh, reader input, too, in what I call the debrief. So uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, really great information that it draws out of the audience. Tom, thanks so much for your great work, and thanks for joining us here today. Thank you very much, Max. I'm glad to be back, and perhaps we'll do it again. And my thanks to Tom Turner for joining us here today. You can find his newsletter and read more about him at mastery-flight-training.com. And of course, I'll include a link to it in the show notes. And now I want to read from an article that AOPA columnist Barry Schiff published back in 2014 in AOPA magazine. In it, he wrote about an accident that occurred back in 2010 that involved a professional 5,000-hour flight instructor and a pilot and they experienced a partial loss of power when operating a Piper Malibu at an altitude of 15,000 feet overhead the Ontario International Airport in Southern California. The airport had a 3,700-foot ceiling and visibility of 10 miles. The broken cloud layer was approximately 3,000 feet thick, but conditions above the clouds were severely clear. Both pilots had instrument ratings, and the aircraft was equipped with a pair of panel-mounted moving map displays. I have presented the circumstances of this flight at safety seminars, and asked pilots in attendance how they would have handled the problem. Most said that they would have used their moving map displays to circle the airport and remain at all times within gliding distance of the two-mile-long runway, a plan of action with which one could hardly disagree. This, however, is not what the pilots of this airplane did. They instead assumed that the engine would continue to deliver some power and allow themselves to be radar vectored beyond gliding distance of the airport. Ultimately, the engine failed to deliver any power at all, resulting in an off-airport crash, bodily injury, and a totaled airplane. Think about this for a moment. If the engine had instead failed suddenly and completely, while 15,000 feet over a 12,000-foot runway, it's less likely that this accident would have occurred. The decision to remain within gliding distance of the airport would have been obvious. There would not have been other possible courses of action to cloud the issue. In other words, regarding a partial engine failure as a total engine failure simplifies the decision-making process. A great article from Barry, and I'll include a link to it in the show notes. So until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. And remember that you can always go around. You can always go around If it don't look right coming down Don't wait until your side may be sliding upside down